Welcome to America's Cannabis Conversation at americascannabisconversation.com. And here's your host, Dan Perkins. Welcome back to the conversation. Joining us today is a very special guest, Dr. Michael Lewis. Dr. Michael Lewis is a former United States military infectious disease specialist, retired colonel. And we're going to talk today about six strategies for managing stress around this infectious disease. Dr. Lewis, thank you for joining the conversation today. It's great to join you. So let's get, let's get right to it. Six strategies for managing stress around infectious disease. Is, is this a different environment for stress than what we've normally experienced like in a heavy flu season or, What's what's going on in your mind, doctor? Well, the biggest thing is, um, you know, not so much the stress of what this virus is and uh, and the, the illness that it's causing, but it's really how we're reacting to it. And I don't mean, I mean, on all levels, I mean, how individuals are reacting to it and society, how our government is reacting to it is causing a huge amount of stress, unlike anything we've ever experienced in our lifetimes. Um, Really, I would have to say you have to go back to 1918, 1919 to even come close to the level of stress that we're feeling, you know, with the great influenza pandemic. Mm Mm-hmm. Doctor, do you think it would be uh, appropriate to add to your list of of environments that are causing stress? The and, and I'm not being critical of you. I'm just saying, with the huge volatility and swings of quote um, data from the clinicians who are trying to formulate policy, the big swings in death and case rates. Is is that also putting pressure that the clinicians are bringing upon themselves and and therefore bringing it upon the American people? Well, a big part of it always, you know, one of the biggest stressors in general is just the concept of the fear of the unknown. And that's been a big driving issue this whole pandemic uh, has been the fear of the unknown because, you know, it's a virus that we've never dealt with before. Um, and so the action and reaction that we've been seeing at all levels are really being driven by that fear of the unknown. And that that can be absolutely um, – uh, I'm just trying to think of the right word. It, it can be um, completely just – get people to freeze up. I mean, it's like deer in the headlights. Um, People don't know what to do. Governments don't know really. There's no single right answer. We're going in so many different directions and the data systems are feeding us. You know, we've got this 24 seven news cycle. We've got so much access to data that that in itself has become overwhelming is in addition to it. Yeah, doctor, I, uh, uh, I, I write a lot of commentary, and early on I did a commentary based on a prognostication by the Imperial College in London, which said um, they believe 500,000 Brits would die and 2.3 million Americans would die. And the American media grabbed hold of that number, those numbers, and I think uh, the way they publicized it, they created, if you would, a panic within the pandemic. And and we've seen numbers, you know, as low as 60,000, now back to possibly 75 to 100, but not millions like was originally forecast. I think that set the tone that that when the numbers started to change, I'm I'm not sure that the American public didn't become disenchanted with the clinicians and what they were trying to do? Well, a lot of it gets back to, again, the unknown, but, you know, there's a lot of things that we know that have always, you know, always hold true in 
I, I'd like to say situations like this, but we're really in such a unique situation. But you have to understand the nature of viruses in the first place is mm-hmm. you know, when you have a virus that that starts to spread like this has, um, mm-hmm. you know, we hear terms like R not, you know, the R sub zero and, you know, how many people one person generally infects. Um, that's not set in stone. I mean, over time, we, you know, we understand what's the typical uh, R not uh, infectability, but especially with something new, we're always trying to understand it. And so those numbers are going to change consistently, but the virus changes also. And we're mm-hmm. starting to hear about the mutations of the virus and, and so on. You know, viruses have existed long before mankind. They're going to exist long after we're gone. We mm-hmm. have always coexisted with them. We have to learn to coexist with them. But we mm-hmm. need to do it, you know, in a way that is much more um, reasonable. It is literally coexist, not lock ourselves in our house and be afraid of it because – even in the most remote places, we're seeing that people are somehow getting infected with this uh, with this virus. So mm-hmm. how we coexist with it, how these numbers change, how these models are always – I mean, literally, a good model should change every single day. It should input the data of the last 24 hours to rework that model. So these models are always going to change, and so we're going to see the numbers come down. They may go up a little bit. They may go down. But part of that reflects that change of a virus in itself. You have to understand, viruses cannot live outside of a host. And Mm -hmm. so if a virus – if you think about Ebola, for example, 20 years ago, Ebola killed 90 95% of anybody that came in in contact with it. Now Mm -hmm. it kills 40 50%. Why? Because – if a virus kills off all its hosts, it's not going to exist anymore. Nature doesn't work that way. So right. as viruses spread, they become less lethal, less virulent, um, because in basic terms of nature, if you kill off a host, then you're going to kill off yourself. Right, right. Doctor, um, I really want to get to your six strategy. So I'd like to pivot now and let's, Let's help the audience uh, with some of the strategies that you've come up with for managing stress. So let's 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 start down that path. Let's start with number one. Yeah, I know we you know we have limited time, so we'll kind of fly through them. But a lot of them okay. kind of work together. But number one, absolutely, is <laughs> information uh, like we're talking about information overload. We're just we're swarmed twenty four seven. There's not enough news to really fill twenty four hours. You know, when we were kids, right. you got the morning newspaper and the evening news, right? That was right. enough news. Um, <laughs> now we got 24-7. We got social media and everybody's got their opinion. And, you know, it's just you're swimming in it. The most important thing in my mind that we could do is turn it off. Limit yourself. We talk about, you know, limiting screen time for kids, you know, because we're right. worried about them being on iPads and playing games. We need to start thinking about limiting screen time for adults because yeah. we just are getting – too much information. Uh, you want to keep informed, but to a limit. I mean, and that leads us really quickly into the other things is get outside and exercise. You know, start setting good lifestyle habits that you may have forsaken over the years because you were working too hard. So ec- daily exercise, eating healthy you know, being grateful for the things that we do have, being around loved ones or use that technology in a good way and and be in contact with loved ones that you can't physically be in contact with and take a breath, you know, we want to call it meditation, whatever, but, you know, think about when you're under stress and you just take a couple of two, three deep breaths, your system calms down so quickly Um, so eating, you know, so if we start eating healthier, put down the sugar and the cake and the candies and the processed foods and eat natural, healthy foods and get out and exercise on a daily basis. And I say get outside and exercise because fresh air, sunshine, vitamin D and all that, all those things can work together. Just good, healthy lifestyle that we need to get back to. Terrific. I agree. Let's keep going. 
<laughs> well, I, I wasn't sure how much time we had, so I rolled a bunch of them in there so we can unpack okay, a little that, bit of that. That's so, fine. Um, me, nutrition, so me, uh, nutrition wise, yeah. go ahead. Yeah, that's, I just wanted to ask you a question, uh, and I'm, no, I'm go not going to, I'm not going to mention my my two sisters' names. One's older, one's younger than me. I'm 74. And it's it's amazing, doctor, that when we talk to them on the phone, and we they live in Ohio, and we live in Florida, and they're, the governor of the state of Ohio is talking about opening up stuff, and they both say it's too soon. And when I ask them, how do you know? What are you basing your decision on? They don't have an answer. They just emotionally feel like it's too soon. And I'm wondering if, as you talked about all the conversations and everything that are going on, is that we're creating a, a enormous pile of experts who have no no right to be experts, but they're they're telling everybody what they think, and that and because it's done on television or radio, it must be true. <laughs> you bring up a great point. Is any anybody with a microphone these days is an expert, right? And right. and so that's part of the reason why we need to limit our exposure to all this is not just limit our exposure to the so-called news that just gets rehashed over and over, but it's really the opinions about the news. I mean, you think about it, you had 600 TV channels. There's not enough news to be able to fill you know one TV channel, let alone 600. So what we're filling it with is opinions about the news. We no longer report the news. We report opinions about the news. And right. so, you know, everybody's an expert. Um, you know, people could question, well, you know, why is this guy, Michael Lewis, on the on on the radio talking about this and who is he? Well, you know, I was trained by the U S army in public health and infectious diseases. I created a system that literally is being used as we speak to track these numbers. 20 years ago, I created that system. And then my, uh, I was fortunate enough to be assigned to uh, um, a U.S. Army's research lab in Bangkok, Thailand for a number of years. And my job literally was to run around Asia developing partners and looking for new diseases like this. Uh, and mm -hmm. I happened to be over there when SARS and bird flu happened. So I actually do wow. have experience <laughs> with this. Right. Um, I'm not saying that I have the right answer. I don't think anybody has the right answer. Uh, and right. if somebody tells you they have the answer, they're, they're full of it. And you might want to move on to the, uh, turn off the radio or the TV and move on to the next right. one. Um, let me, let me say to, uh, on behalf of our audience, thank you for your service. I, I'm a retired military myself and, and I understand how important, um, I'm an army, our army grunt, uh, people like you are to to the defense of our country and um you know we had the cdc tell us wash your hands safe distance wear a mask and consider gloves three things that we should do can you give me and our audience three things that um dr michael lewis would recommend are the on your top three things that people should do in this disease period well, I, I question – well, first of all, I'm going to say I think gloves are not a good idea. I'll just say that um, because most people don't know how to put them on, take them off, and then they give them, themselves a, a sense of uh, safety that they don't really have. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't believe gloves from the average person are actually a really good idea. Uh, I think that masks, I've seen so many – if you go to any store, it's just this – comedy of how people are wearing masks or not. So most people don't even have a clue how to wear a mask. Uh, okay. That's safe, uh, safe and everything. So, but three things. Um, I would say take the opportunity now to set those lifestyle factors that are going to serve you in the long run. And two of them being diet and exercise. Eating healthy mm. food and regular exercise would be absolutely number one. Number two, um, the idea of washing washing your hands uh, cannot be overemphasized. Uh, that's really how we're going to do it. And but uh, I guess maybe more than three. But I would say you've just got to 
you know, there's an old saying, I'm, I'm going to go back to this, from World War II in England, you brought up, we started the conversation about uh, statistics from England. Let's go back to England. And, mm-hmm. and the, you know, the, the Battle of Britain and, uh, and World War II. And there was a saying, and there's posters and everything, is keep calm and carry on. And that is, I think, sums up so much of it. Stop freaking out about this. this is, <laughs> now, if you're 75 years old and you've got all kinds of health problems, yeah, you should be not worried. You should be appropriately concerned to uh, limit your exposure. But healthy yeah. people, you know, young, healthy people, um, I, I, I think the, the fact that we're keeping people in the house and we're going to be causing so many more problems down the line, all this mm-hmm. financial stress is going to come out uh, right. over the next months or years. It's going to come out right. in ways that you don't necessarily think about. Suicide's one easily that you could think about. There's going to be a major increase in suicide. There's going to be a lot of physical and mental health issues that mm-hmm. we're going to see over the next four or five years because of this, that I don't know if we're even to the point of getting our head above the water to even think about these longer term issues. And that's one of the reasons why you know people are saying, let's get the country back to work. Let's get, you know, let's get out of this shelter in place because, because, the long-term issues on our health, our physical health, our mental health, uh, I think are going to be really absolutely devastating the longer we're in this economic shutdown. Unfortunately, doctor, we're out of time and I want to thank you. We've been speaking with retired Colonel Michael Lewis, doctor who was a U.S. military infectious disease specialist, and he's been giving us uh, six ideas of how to manage stress around infectious disease. Doctor, how do people get a hold of you or follow you in a in an orderly fashion and uh, learn from your wisdom and knowledge? Well, two two big things. When I retired from the military, I started a, a small nonprofit uh, focused around brain health, uh, and certainly stress is a major uh, decrement to brain health. So you can find a website for for my nonprofit is brainhealtheducation.org. It's brainhealtheducation.org. Mm-hmm. And been you know trying to move a little bit more onto video platforms stuff like that. And so if you if you're into YouTube, go to CV Sciences. Look up CV Sciences on YouTube. That's uh, C as in Charlie, V as in Victor, and um, and lots of great information we're uh, putting up on that platform all the time. Doctor Lewis, it was a pleasure. Thank you for your knowledge and thank you for joining us today. It was my pleasure. If uh, you didn't hear all of Dr. Lewis's uh, interview today, you can go to w420radionetwork.com and the archive section looks into Dr. Lewis. And you can also listen to our other shows. We'll be right back. Everywhere you look, you see stories about cannabis and CBD. But how can you trust that you're getting accurate information? We want to introduce you to a new radio program called America's Cannabis Conversation, This program is designed to help you gain as much information as you can about the cannabis industry. Every week, this one-hour program connects you with experts from many facets of the cannabis business to grow your knowledge and help you make better, more informed decisions. Join the conversation at americascannabisconversation.com. Time now for the lowdown on another high-time experience. Here's 420 Lifestyle Correspondent Rich Walkoff. All right. Well, we're here on the Empress Yacht in Richmond Marina, Richmond, California, with a fun talk with two guys who've been in the biz for a long time. Connect Canna's Brad Robertson from Guild Extracts and Big Red from Apex Extractions in Oakland. You guys are telling me some amazing stories before we get into what you do. But a year ago, gunfire, looting of your stores, crazy stuff. Big Red, you told me you lost how much? I lost over $5 million uh, just about a year ago during the Oakland riots. Yeah, what actually went down? 
Well, um, the, the, there was a group of people that were going around targeting all the cannabis business. They uh, got their got all our addresses off the internet because the BCC listed all our addresses. So they print that that address off uh, off the internet, and they went from cannabis place to cannabis place in Oakland with a group of 200 to 300 people, and they just bum rushed the uh, the buildings. They ripped open our doors, and it looked like uh, the most hellish version of black friday ever yeah just people piling in and 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 we had one guard there at the time and he literally put his hands up and walked out the building and was like i there's nothing i can do with this <laughs> so yeah. yeah he was outnumbered he and, was and, outnumbered and outgunned, yeah. and outgunned yeah. well, when you got into the business before it was legal and then you get compliant you're doing all the right things and for this to happen and for you to lose so much i mean I, every time i walk into a dispensary security looks super tight right. but if you're overwhelmed by armed thieves what can you do there, there's literally nothing you could do at that point uh you know and and we of course beefed up our security out after this incident and uh, about six months later after having to restart from square one uh because dealing with not getting any help from our insurance companies you know we we started back from square one and we ended up uh Hiring more security, more militant, ex-military security guards. And uh, on, on inauguration night, we actually had an, that same group of people come back, but it wasn't as big as a group. There was about uh, 80 to 100 of them. And um, we actually ended up getting in a gunfight that night. And uh, somebody uh, pulled out their gun, fired a gun. And next thing you know, my security guards and, and these people who were trying to rob us started exchanging gunfight and stuff. And there was over 100 uh, casings found on the ground afterwards. Yeah, but thankfully everybody was okay. And you, and you kept your product this time? Yep, product was, didn't get stolen. Uh, unfortunately, I did have two guards that uh, did get shot in the event. But... Uh, they both survived. Uh, they're both doing fine now. One got grazed, and the other one got uh, shot in the the abdomen. But uh, both of them are doing fine, uh, walking around just fine now and stuff. Yeah, so. but so much for safe and legal when you're dealing with this kind of renegade behavior on, on your on your dispensary. Yeah, no, it's uh, and we've always been used to this kind of behavior in cannabis. Uh, we've before uh, before Proposition 64 happened, we'd have to worry about robberies and the cops. Now we just have to worry about robberies. Wow. So that's that's the one plus is we at least don't have to worry about the cops coming in and raiding us anymore. Yeah. <laughs> now, Brad, Brad Robertson from uh, Guild Extracts, you had a similar tale in some respects, but I don't know if the shootout got anybody hurt. What, what went down? Yeah, so we, same thing, we had about 300 cars full of people rammed through our gates um, and went straight into the building, pulling plants. Uh, they had already looted a lot of other places, so as they were, like, in our parking lot, there was boxes and uh, and, and stuff from every other dispensary and, and uh, different cannabis companies in Oakland. Um, and there, uh, one of the guards exchanged some gunfire, uh, and they came two nights in a row after that. Um, and they just kept ramming in through the gates, and of course the next couple times there wasn't anything to grab, but uh, after the first kind of event, we um, we got everything out, and luckily the BCC let, you know, kind of ease the regulations so we could really pull a lot of our inventory out and bring it to different premises. Uh, premises and. So yeah, it was just it was it was crazy. <laughs> so BCC Bureau of Cannabis, uh, yeah, yeah. You describe it for me. Yeah, so the yeah the Bureau of Cannabis Control um, uh, in California, uh, they immediately, like Red was saying, they they went through the list that was that was public on the internet, and they just hit every single cannabis operator, and then. Literally that night, they took they they took everyone's addresses down. Thank God. Yeah, well, well, but the word is out. They know where yeah, you're at. So exactly. you've got to adjust accordingly. Whether it's it's safe safes or don't keep all your product on the premises. What do you do, Red? 
Oh, well, like I said, we beefed up security. We we reinforced our gates. We reinforced our doors. Welded doors shut. Uh, we actually welded doors shut, and we actually stayed closed for uh, about three weeks to wait until everything calmed down. Yeah. Um, and then and then of course we cleaned everything back up, got back to business, um, and started extracting again. And then, like I said, about six months later, the the people were just waiting for another incident because they used the the riots in Oakland as cover because all the police officers were in downtown Oakland dealing with all the rioters. So we were so far away from downtown that there was no police uh, presence. Uh, we did actually have a cop show up about 20 minutes into the, the robbery and they pulled onto our street, saw about two to 300 people in cars and running around. And these two cops ended up walk, uh, just driving off. Like, there's nothing we could do about it because right. they had been outnumbered and yeah, stuff. Yeah. You know, this so. is the Wild West in 2021 in yeah. an urban center. And I wonder how unique your experiences are. Is this happening? Have you heard in your community that this sort of assault and, and violence against uh, your, your guards to steal your product has happened elsewhere, you know, commonly? It ha- Well, that... that uh, with the riots, it happened all throughout California. Every I don't know I don't know one operator in in uh, in the East Bay that did not get hit. Yeah. The day after, uh, uh, Cuddy is our our head of sales, and I I did a ride along with him, and we brought water and coffee and brooms, and you know we weren't we weren't packaging or extracting. You know, of course, the next day, and so I was I was just like, let's get all of our crew out, let's go to all of the dispensaries that were hit. Because these people, you know, a lot of them are family owned. Everyone has a lot of their own money in it. And, and it and it really kind of, you know, kicked them with all the heavy taxes and regulations that we already have. Just to have all the inventory stolen. And so, yeah, we went around and helped clean up. And, you know, it's it's a community. And we, we need to stick together, especially through hard times like yeah, that. It, it's kind of ironic is that you're caught in the crossfire. Here you are kind of the people's service right you're providing an essential service providing medicine and and cannabis in in every in any variety of forms and now the people are revolting against any of a repressive their perception of a repressive regime or a repressive government whatever or police brutality whatever they want to be and then you guys are aligned with them yet you're the enemy on that night you know, it was a free for all. There was not really much. Uh, no business was safe. It didn't yeah. matter if you were yeah. selling kids' clothes or if you were selling cannabis. Uh, you know, during those riots, uh, there was no business that was safe and unhurt. Unhurt yeah. by it. Yeah. I mean, black owned, white owned. It didn't matter. People just cared about what what can we get out of this. Yeah, so much for compliance, so much about being legal, so much about doing things the right way and providing a, a healthy service for the community. Now, you guys talk about extractions, and before we uh, began this interview, you were, you were giving me a little lowdown on how you create these things. So for the novice or the, uno- the, the non-aficionado, what are we talking about? Uh, we're, we're talking about um, extracted cannabinoids from the plant. So uh, what myself and Brad do is we literally strip all the essential cannabinoids and terpenes from the plant so the consumer can smoke that product and not be uh, consuming the stuff that they don't want, like the fats, the lipids, the, the chlorophylls and stuff, you know, the, the excess plant material mm-hmm. and stuff. So we focus on the, the stuff that actually has the true healing power to the plant yeah beautiful and you talked about it like a honey like a a drippy sweet honey is it is it a a resin an oil how would you characterize it 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 comes in all different forms so uh there's there's the oils there's the batters there's the sauces there's the sugars we have all different ways uh that we can make the product we could even make diamonds that look like little tiny crystals that that you see on a wedding ring (laughs) that's like a keef uh, no, Keef is actually the uh, the the trichrome head on the plant that what gives it the that frosty look to it. Uh, but what we're doing is we're actually stripping the oils that are inside those trichrome heads a lot of times. Okay, so you got to go to school for chemistry. How did you learn your stuff, Brad? <laughs> <clears throat> I self-taught for the most part. I just uh, anytime I really want to learn something, um, I just put my head down and. You know, with the invention of the iPhone and just having the internet, you have 
a wealth of information at your fingertips and you can pretty much teach yourself anything um, as long as you're dedicated and with cannabis I've always been very dedicated okay so what are the some of the uh, cool products that you're most proud of um, so we were the first company to release pure THCA crystalline into the market um, it's 99.99 percent pure uh, THCA so THCA is actually the most prevalent compound on the plant um, and it is actually non-psychotropic um, until you heat it up and it decarboxylizes into Delta 9 THC which actually gives you the high um, even though THCA if you eat it has a lot of therapeutic benefits also uh, it's a very powerful anti-inflammatory um, so I would say that is probably what I'm most proud of. So 99%, I mean, I've, I've vaped with the 80% on, on those, which are, you know, kick your butt. 99%, I mean, where do you stand? Hand the keys to somebody else, right? Yeah, yeah no, exactly. And that's the awesome thing about Brad and, and the Guild and stuff, man. These guys were isolating those those uh, cannabinoids before anybody else and stuff. I mean, I remember seeing their guys' products um, at shows and shops and being like, wow, how the F did you guys do this? Uh, and, you know, and that's what really got me into it, too, a lot more is watching these guys do it. And that's the great thing about the cannabis industry is we love to share. Mm -hmm. so, so it's not like a proprietary formula that you might have that you're going to keep under wraps. You're sharing the knowledge. Well, sharing it with the community, not with, like, rivals. <laughs> no, well, like, the you know, the big the big money people who have never spent a day in the cannabis industry and think they can buy their way their way into it and haven't done uh, haven't sacrificed you know um you know their livelihood and uh to to do this and, and don't have the passion to just see dollar signs i wouldn't share with them okay you feel optimistic about the future for what you guys do given the challenges you face with you know lootings and shootings and you know all the restrictions and taxes for california cultivators and the like yeah no I mean, I mean i feel very optimistic about it i feel that you know the the cannabis community has always been a tight-knit com community so we like to support each other and we know who's who's in it for the money and who's in it for the plant so uh working with with other extractors or other farmers that really have fought to to be where we are today i mean both me and brad have been raided and arrested for for what we've been want but for 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 this plant and it's something that we have a passion for and you know having our our houses turned upside down and our lives turned upside down didn't stop us you know and and that's a lot of these people came in after things became legal now they're like oh well i'm not going to get arrested so i'm going to come in here and i'm going to put all this money in here and stuff well you see a lot of those companies failing too too because yeah. it it's about the love of the plant and uh most consumers see that and understand that and they know what brands to go out to, uh, go out and support yeah. so like big red from apex extractions in oakland and brad robertson from guild extracts you feel is as optimistic about the future for your business and, and the cannabis industry as a whole? Definitely. Look, as they say, ganja is the healing of the nation. And it is, it's, it's such a medicine. And it's just been, you know, behind this curtain for so long. And they haven't been able to do, they haven't been able to research it. And the funding for a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of this institutional or like, you know, kind of, uh, um, I'm trying to look for the That's word. That's um, it out, find, yeah. your word. <laughs> find your word yeah no but like yeah a lot of the a lot of the studies that you know need to happen with cannabinoids in general and terpenes and the way they all intermingle um has just not been there and and so i feel like now that this veil has fallen you know research can be done you know and they can kind of see like look you have an endocannabinoid system you make an andamine you know you make it you make cannabinoids endocannabinoids and so so to just like throw behind this like veil like oh all cannabis is bad it has no you know there's a reason it helps people and it's yeah. because if you have an if you have a deficiency in a system in your body you know and it's just like if you're with insulin you know if you're a diabetic and you're not getting insulin you know you have to take insulin well if your if your body is not producing enough you know endocannabinoids then you have to you know, fill that gap. And, and that's why cannabis is such a healing plant 
and we're just in the beginnings of of, food, yeah. of, of realizing the the impact that this, sure. these compounds have on on oneself and and I look I I look forward if I don't make a dollar as long as cannabis can help people I'm here yeah you know? right you guys are pioneers doing it the right way Brad Robertson from Guild Extracts and Big Red from Apex Extractions you guys are in Richmond and in Oakland and this is Connect Canada we're aboard the Empress Yacht in Richmond Marina in Richmond California been a ton of fun catching up with you guys and hearing your stories thanks for that uh, this is america's cannabis conversation on the w420 radio network we'll link up to these guys uh, on our website at w420 radio network.com slash archive if you want to hear excerpts or hear it again i'm rich walcoff thanks for listening and we'll be right back America's newest and fastest growing cannabis focused radio network is expanding across the country and looking to add to our sales and marketing team. America's Cannabis Conversation offers listeners insight and information on the exploding world of cannabis. It also gives advertisers the opportunity to reach a hyper targeted audience, literally neighborhood by neighborhood, in markets all across the country. We're looking for a few motivated individuals that want to essentially run their own local business. To learn more about this exciting opportunity or to apply, visit americascannabisconversation.com. Welcome back to the conversation. Joining us today is our old friend, our cannabis doctor on call, Dr. Jordan Tischler. Jordan, welcome back to the program. Well, thank you so much. And who are you calling old? <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> <laughs> Old, but not in age, but in time. Exactly. Yes. Sounds lovely. Yes. So, doctor, we're facing an issue. Um, we, you and I talked some time ago about the one out of four Americans suffering with anxiety or severe depression. And I'm wondering, as we look at the possibility of going back to work, whether that creates all new challenges for you and your practice of people going back to work and their anxiety about being out of the workforce for a year or more trying to go back and fit in. I, absolutely. I think, you know, just uh, the, the pandemic has, you know, um, created a, a range of issues and challenges. And I think the resolution of the pandemic is going to create or is creating uh, a whole new set. Um, you know, first of all, there's the question of it looks like the pandemic is resolving. Uh, certainly businesses and individuals are kind of acting like that. And we're getting guidance from the CDC that all sort of suggests that the coast, if not clear, is sort of getting clear. Um, but I think that any reasonable person at this point would say, yeah, how, how sure is that, you know, and do I need to worry that we will be going back ahead of it's actually being safe or are there variants that will come along that are not covered by the various vaccines that are currently deployed? And I, and I don't think we have answers to those questions. And when we don't have answers to those questions, obviously that prov provokes anxiety. So I think that that's, you know, one level of issue. Um, and then to your point, we many of us have been either out of work or working in some very different than usual uh, circumstances and going back to the office um, in a very literal fashion, I think can uh, provoke anxiety about how things were and you know, I think everybody has kind of longed so much for the, 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 you know, the way things were that we haven't really grappled with the fact that things weren't that great beforehand. And so rushing right back into what was not so great um, is, is probably less than ideal. And if we were really smart monkeys, which we're not, um, then we would probably be trying to learn something from the good things that came out of the pandemic changes. Um, and trying to carry those forward. And I'm not seeing a lot of that at this point. Um, so I, I definitely think that this is just the next set of challenges um, to, to, to people and to patients. Doctor, there's a couple of things that, that I think have added dramatic confusion and uncertainty, as you described it, to the people is the, the vacillation of CDC and there the changes in in the protocols and 
what's going on and what's not going to mean. One day we have children going to summer camp have to wear a mask and all the counselors have to wear a mask and you have to be self-distancing. And then within 24 to 48 hours, they rescind that whole thing and said, no, you don't need masks. If you've all been vaccinated, just go on. So it, it, it creates an element of significant, in my opinion, significant confusion uh, and trust in what they're hearing. Uh, I mean, we heard we heard of the last few days, and I'm not trying to be political here, doctor. I'm just doing what I'm hearing, is that the mainstream media who criticized Donald Trump for suggesting that, in fact, it was a China virus and it came out of the Wuhan lab and and they they lambasted him and attacked him. And we found out recently that, yeah, it's probably true. But the reason they did it is because they had a vendetta against him trying to do the best for our readers and for the American people. So I think that, that there's a huge amount of confusion. Dr. Fauci's under quite a significant attack now uh, about his policies and what he's saying. And, and um, so I think there's a great deal of confusion. And I think the confusion from the people we want to trust the most, the medical professionals, which have, in my opinion, the whole thing's been politicized on a medical standpoint, uh, it's no wonder that people are afraid and don't know really what to do because they don't know what to believe. I agree with you 100% that the largest problem we're facing, and this is true with both uh, the current and the former administration, is that they have um, politicized the advice from scientists and medical professionals and I agree that undermines the credibility of those professionals as well as uh, the institutions that they serve. And uh, I think that that's a huge issue. There, we have to make some amount of leeway for the fact that the facts are accumulating over time, and that may in fact change the point of view of our learned uh, colleagues. But uh, but those facts should be things that we can point to in terms of science and, and published re- results. Um, but you're right. There's an awful lot of, um, uh, you know, a political overlay, uh, you know, for example, with regard to some of the mask wearing and social distancing. Um, my understanding has been that some of those guidelines were relaxed, not because it was necessarily so safe to relax them, but rather to um, encourage people to get vaccinated. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, while I think that people should absolutely get vaccinated, um, I think that that should be uh, promoted in a way that uses facts and, 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 you know, is clearly based on, uh, you know, the science of the situation and not on this sort of like, well, if we let them do, you know, take off their masks, you know, because they're vaccinated, that would incentivize people to get vaccinated. I think that if if you're looking around at, at the problems we faced over the last, you know, 15, 18 months, and there's no medical reason that you should not be vaccinated and you don't want to be vaccinated, uh, <clears throat> my personal take is that you need a real discussion about the facts before you make that decision. But I certainly don't think that we should be, you know, trying to sort of incentivize or hoodwink or um, otherwise kind of uh, lead people down a garden path. Well, you know, it's I don't interesting. know how we're going to handle vaccination. I mean, I think that everybody should be vaccinated, but I don't know how, you know, how that comes about. And I don't know how you um, promote that in a fair and, and morally appropriate fashion. And I don't know how you um, enforce it if or if you enforce it uh, in certain circumstances where you might want to make sure that people know that they're in a safe crowd of people. That's, um, I hate to say this, but above my pay grade. But I think that it is a very interesting and complex discussion to think about public health versus individual choice. Uh, Mm -hmm. My personal point of view on this is somewhere in the middle, which is to say, I don't like being forced to do anything um, but I also recognize that there is sometimes a greater good. Um, and, uh, you know, I've been vaccinated for a number of months, and I did that largely because 
uh, I thought it was important not only to my own health, but to the health of the people around me, particularly many elderly people. Um, and, uh, and so I think that that was the right thing to do. Uh, whether that should be enforced or not, uh, you know, that's, I think, again, a, a larger, you know, big picture government issue. I will say that um, I do think that we have some issues around trust um, in this country, and uh, at least for people of color, that's pretty well justified. Nonetheless, we need to address that by building trust and educating people. Um, and if we are at you know roughly 50% vaccination rate, the good news there is that we haven't seen a lot of untoward outcomes as a result of a very large pool of people being vaccinated and that doesn't even look globally that's just looking within our own country um, mm -hmm. so i think that at some point um you know this will be proven trustworthy regardless of what anybody actually says about it so i think you know there's that issue i think that there's a large uh contingent of people who are against vaccines in general um mm -hmm. and uh you know those people i think are generally speaking um not devotees of data um and <laughs> uh and i think that that's uh problematic you know because they they hopefully i think they're a smallish group of folk but they certainly are loud and um and i think that that you know tends to gum up the works we've been speaking with dr jordan tischler our cannabis doctor on call uh thank you for joining us today doctor Welcome back to the conversation. Joining us today is our expert, our cannabis doctor on call. I've asked Dr. Jordan Tischler to join us today because he's going to be able to give us firsthand experience of a medical practitioner who was trying to keep his practice going and serving people's needs during this pandemic. Dr. Jordan, thank you for joining us today. Always my pleasure to be here. So let's talk about what it was like for Dr. Jordan Tischler to come through the last four months in a practice uh, in the state of Massachusetts where medical marijuana is legal. What happened to your practice and in your practice over the last four months? It's been very interesting. Uh, so one of the first things was that when uh, – you know, when things started to get rocky, um, I very quickly moved the practice to an all telehealth, all online approach. Um, I had been using telehealth here and there uh, along the way for several years and really had the feeling that it was, um, you know, okay, but not as good as seeing people face to face. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, you know, but under the circumstances, I wanted to be able to provide care to people and we needed to do it that way. So we did it. And now that I've been at this for a while, I actually think that there are some advantages to telehealth. Um, I, I not only can I reach uh, sort of a broader geographic area, but it's also something very nice about seeing people in their comfortable home environment. Um, I had a patient who I saw a few weeks ago, she was sitting in her kitchen. She seemed very relaxed. We were having a good conversation about what she needs to accomplish for her health. And then her five-year-old crawled into her lap and wanted to snuggle. And I thought that was lovely. You don't, you know, it's a little bit like making house calls in the, in the old days, you know, mm -hmm. you really get to know people in a different way that way. And, um, and so actually I've really come to appreciate the telemedicine approach and, um, and, and actually are now lobbying for this to become a, a more permanent option for, for doing this uh, business. If you look at a tele, yeah, telemedicine call versus an office call, is there a difference in time? No, not at least the way I'm doing it. It's, um, uh, you know, I, I spend an hour with every uh, initial visit. So it's pretty much the same thing. And I'm, using the same materials, uh, you know, when, when people come to the office physically, I would be giving them this sort of green folder with a bunch of pages in it that we would then go through in the office to talk about all the various topics, um, which was good because that way, 
you know, people go home with something they've seen before when I talked about it with them, but then they could refresh their memory and kind of let it sink in. Uh, and it also made sure that I didn't forget anything important uh, in the process. And so I've just simply turned all of those pages into a PDF that I email people after we start our, our telehealth conversation, and then we open them up and go through them together just like that. Um, so it really is basically the same kind of a visit in terms of the, the logistics. If you were seeing before the pandemic, you were seeing 20 patients a day in person during the pandemic, what did it drop to? Oh, 15? it didn't drop at all. No, I mean, we, we're still seeing exactly the same number of patients per day or maybe slightly higher because we've sort of um, uh, been short of shoehorn. I mean, the, the, the demand for appointments went up, um, which is really to your point about uh, this epidemic, this, this second epidemic of anxiety and depression and PTSD that we're seeing, um, there's tremendous demand. And so we have been seeing more patients rather than fewer patients. So you've been buried. Yeah. I mean, not in a bad way. It hasn't been a, it, it, I mean, you know, one could imagine you could have an influx that was, you know, greater than your capacity and you were, harried and trying to do it all and take care of all these patients. And uh, it hasn't been that bad, but, but, um, but we've certainly seen an increase in, in, uh, in demand. And it's been interesting here in Massachusetts, you had mentioned in a previous uh, comment about, you know, the, the states that have deemed medical to be um, uh, a, necess a necessary service um, mm -hmm. and that most of the studies, the states that also had recreational had deemed that to be necessary. Uh, Massachusetts was the only state that said, no, medical is necessary, but recreational is not necessary. And so I think that that has contributed a little bit to the uptick in people coming to see me um, that who were previously using cannabis in a sort of medical self-treatment kind of fashion. Um, right. Uh, and, but who could no longer do that. Um, and it, so it's been very interesting for us to try to figure out, well, you know, who's a stoner who just wants to get their card because suddenly they've been cut off versus who is out there who is using this absolutely legitimately for medical use, not necessarily the best way, but, they were, but, but their purpose was the right one. And how do we help those people understand um, and, and get better benefit. And what I've seen so far, <clears throat> excuse me, is a huge percentage of the people coming in from that recreational market have in fact got legitimate medical problems and actually can really benefit from medical uh, guidance. And, and, and I think that most of the people who've then come to me and received that guidance have recognized the value there. Um, and so it gets really to the, to the point of, um, you know, within this industry, there's a very big push towards treating everybody as though they were recreational because mm -hmm. it lets the dispensaries sell a lot of product, which I can totally understand. But in reality, for people who have illnesses, uh, lots of product and lots of different products is not usually all that helpful. It leads to overuse and confusion and not getting the best results. Whereas if we have something that's a little bit more buttoned down and a little bit more like the sort of conventional medical system that after all evolved over a hundred years to be, you know, on, based on best practices, this allows us to be able to really help people and to really use this stuff in a way that that kind of cuts right to the chase and gets people the benefit that they're looking for. Doctor, what what percentage do you think of your practice today is telehealth? No, it's a hundred percent right now. A hundred percent of your practice is telehealth. A hundred percent. I haven't I haven't seen a single human being in the office since the uh, early March. But wow. um, so it's all telehealth, uh, and we're sort of still still working out some of the kinks around which telehealth providers are the are the best. Uh, mm -hmm. But it's all been telehealth. Yeah. Wow. Do you expect that that will be your practice of the future or will will you see begin to see people come back to the office? Uh, 
You know, that's a great question. And part of it, part of the answer to that is that in Massachusetts, as with many other states, there are requirements built into the law uh, that governs medical cannabis that require an inpatient, uh, an in-person visit, um, you know, every so often and more Mm -hmm. typically annually. Um, Mm -hmm. And uh, quite frankly, I think that there are political reasons for that stipulation in the law having to do with concerns about unscrupulous practitioners not really seeing or taking care of people and just kind of doling out the cards. But right. and, and, and so some safeguards around that issue probably are appropriate, but I'm not sure that this is the right way to address the issue. And frankly, if we were able to uh, change that policy so that we could continue using telehealth, I think that would actually be a good thing. It doesn't mean I would never see anybody in person, but it would give me the flexibility. I mean, Massachusetts is a tiny state compared to most. However, Mm -hmm. it's still two and a half hours across, and I have patients who come literally from the far end of Massachusetts, two and a half hours, to see me because there really aren't anybody, any other people practicing the kind of medicine that I practice. And so, you know, if they're really sick and they really, really need a real doctor to help them with this, there aren't that many to choose from. Uh, mm. And I'm working on fixing that. But, right, but it means that the sickest people are the ones who have to schlep all the way across the state, whereas right. if they were to allow me to use telemedicine going forward, I can see them in their home, you know, and that, that makes it easier for them. And that's a plus. So with the patients that you're seeing now over the last four months, um, is people dealing with depression and anxiety uh, a significant portion of what you're seeing? Oh, without question. I would, I would say maybe about 25%. Um, and prior to COVID, I would say it was uh, maybe 20%. I mean, so there's definitely a bump up, um, but, uh, you know, it's not an astronomical bump up. Uh-huh. As this been, if this shutdown continues to four or, or five or six months or perhaps even longer, uh, would you see, do you think there'll be increases in, in anxiety and, and depression? You know, that's a very interesting question. I mean, essentially, uh, you're kind of asking, uh, has, has the anxiety, depression, PTSD that stems from all of these social changes, have we been at it long enough for that to level out or are people going to get, you know, um, develop more and more trouble? Um, I don't think I know the answer to that. I think, I guess what I would say is over the course of the summer, what I really expect to see happen, uh, unfortunately, is I expect to see the government is trying to sort of re-normalize things. And I expect that that's not going to work very well. I think that when we reopen various things, we're going to then see a spike in cases. Um, And if the government then responds, as I would hope it should, which would be to reimpose more quarantine, um, and I'm not sure that the government will do that, but I think it should under those circumstances, then I think we're going to see, you know, a, a, a second wave of anxiety and PTSD come from that. At some point, I hope that, you know, we can, that the whole thing levels off, you know, that we, we, we get to a place where we can, if we're stuck in a quarantine situation, kind of stop yearning for what it used to be and look at this as the new normal. And I think that if we can reframe this period of time going forward as just kind of this is the way it's going to be for a while until we get this better under control, meaning a vaccine or something like that, um, I think then the anxiety and stuff will kind of calm down. Right now, where everyone is so, like, let's reopen and everybody is so focused on what they've lost from the pre-COVID time, that's the setup for anxiety. Um, And, you know, once we kind of move past that and start to understand ourselves as being in a new era, I'm hopeful that some of this anxiety will abate. There's a reason why you have we have you on the show because you're really that good, and I appreciate the time you've given us today. 
thank you for joining us today, Doctor, and uh, we look forward to having you on again soon. How can people follow you or get in touch with you? Thank you so much for the kind words and the opportunity to speak to people. If people want to get in touch, they can always go to my website, which is inhalemd.com. Again, inhalemd.com, where they'll find lots and lots of articles on cannabis for various topics and various uh, illnesses, and they can always reach out to me through the website as well. Thank you. We've been uh, talking to our America's Converse Cannabis Conversation, Dr. On Call, Dr. Jordan Tischler. And uh, if you missed any of the interview today, you better go to uh, w420radionetwork.com, go to the show website, America's Cannabis Conversation, and go to the archive section and listen to what you missed on this show and look for previous episodes with the doctor and other people to expand your knowledge about cannabis. W420radionetwork.com.